Well, good morning. Welcome to Walden Community Church. My name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor here. It's summer. <laughs> it's summer, and the kids are out of school. That means it's time for pool parties and grilling in the backyard and for a whole new lineup of summer TV. And I don't know if uh, you know this, but summer TV is mindless. Uh, there's no thinking involved. There's no in-depth stories. There's no hard-hitting dramas. It's typically just bubblegum, popcorn filler, and then you wait until the fall programming begins. Joanna and I, of course, have some of our favorite TV shows that we watch uh, all the time, and we started to notice that there's this particular trend to what happens in all our shows, right when summer begins. Right before your favorite show goes off the air for summer, your show will typically end in some sort of steamy, or action-packed cliffhanger. Someone is shot, stabbed, kidnapped. Someone's pregnant, someone's missing. Someone's pregnant and missing. <laughs> the two people who you were hoping would kiss all season long, they do. And then the season ends with a big question mark. Tune in next season to find out what happens. And then you wait and you wonder all summer long, I wonder what's gonna happen. And you know what? The tension builds. Summer ends, your show comes back on the air, there's the big return, and then when it airs, this show that you've been waiting for all summer long, they just wrap it up with a nice neat bow instantly. I mean, the show just instantly resets back to how it used to be like nothing happened. Turned out, the bullet missed, and they got shot only in the arm. Turns out your hero wasn't kidnapped. They were just on vacation. Uh, your hero and heroine decide that their kiss was foolish, and they go back to being just friends. And by episode two, it's like the cliffhanger never happened at all. Joanna and I, we call this a reset. We'll say, hey, what happened on the show? Eh, it just reset. A reset can do wonders for a problem. If you're stuck, you don't know what to do, just reset it. I used to work at a computer IT desk and 90% of the people who called in with computer problems, we just told them to restart their computer and call us back if there was an issue. And most people didn't call back. And so now with summer here, this just seems like a good time for a reset. These past two years have been uh, a lot of fun. Social distancing, masks, uh, an election that was very stressful. Uh, we've been a divided country over the sick, over police, over race, and we're still not any closer to finding out what happened to Carol Baskin's husband. We're all overwhelmed, aren't we? If you ask me how I am uh, in my day to day, I'm gonna answer back, tired. We feel overextended. In The Lord of the Rings, Bilbo says that he feels like too little butter stretched over too much bread. My life needs a reset. We were lied to anyway. We were told that the future would be easy, right? We were told that all of this technology would make our lives easier. We'd have self-cleaning ovens, we'd have self-cleaning kitchens, we would have floating leashes that would walk the dogs, we would have lawnmowers that worked on remote control and they would cut our grass, and we would just rock in the hammock in the front yard and drink a nice cold glass of sweet tea. We were lied to. Life isn't less stressful now, thanks to technology, it's more stressful. My, my life's pace has not slowed down. We're all running towards a finish line and we're hoping for this big payout, but either the finish line keeps getting moved or it just disappoints us when we get there. We need a reset in the things that we pursue. Remember when we'd see somebody in their 50s or 60s in a shiny new sports car and we'd say, ah, they're going through a midlife crisis. Well, now we have quarter-life crisis. Did you know this? It's true. Psychologists say there's a period of insecurity and doubt and disappointment surrounding your career, your relationships, your financial situations. It's a crisis involving anxiety over the direction and the quality of your life, which 
is most commonly experienced in a period between your 20s to your mid-30s. Basically, it's people who are pushed all through their youth to succeed, to do well, only to graduate, get a job early, and then discover, this is it? This is all life is? This is what I was working so hard for? We need to reset our anxieties. Did you know that suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the U.S. for all ages? Every day, approximately 130 Americans die by suicide. There is one death by suicide in the U.S. every 11 minutes. Suicide takes the lives of over 48,500 Americans every single year. Why? Anxiety, depression, mental health issues. Depression affects 20 to 25% of Americans ages 18 and over in any given year. And don't think that it only happens to other people. In fact, most studies show that depression and suicide is more prevalent in well-to-do neighborhoods. We all need a reset. We, we need a reset in our relationships. Again, thanks to COVID, we've all been forced to put up with the absence of other people in our lives. It feels like we've all lived through a very mild form of solitary confinement. And the key aspect of that is that we've experienced social deprivation to be deprived of contact with other people, to be deprived of natural and normal social interaction. All of these things that connect us with one another have become problematic and prohibited. And this is also something that can lead to depression and anxiety. We need a reset. A and us, as Christians, I mean, we're, we're really no better off. We're all out of practice attending church out of practice helping and supporting and serving. We're out of practice being more loving and putting that on display. Even though we say we have God and that God is moving in our life, we need a reset in our faith. Because a reset asks, where does this go? A reset asks, okay, what does this do? What is God calling us to do as a church? As we head into this summer slump, I'm challenging us to maybe strip away the clutter, to simplify, and to reset. For summer, we're going to take a look at pushing that big reset button in our lives, in our life, our pursuits, our anxieties, our compassion, in the rules that we make, our relationships, our faith, and even our future. And I know, summer is a time where we travel and we have vacations planned, and, and we can't help that. But let's not lose this momentum that we have. Let's be consistent with stepping back into attending church. Please commit to attending through the summer as much as you can, and I think you'll be glad that you did. You know, we have two services here at Walden Church. We have one service at 9.30 with a choir, and we have one service at 11 with our worship band, and we are fully open, fully open. We don't require masks. There's no social distancing. We have fellowship. We have shaking hands. We have children's classes. Please come return to church and get this experience of corporate worship once again. We can't wait to have you back. Today, we're going to read from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. We're going to begin in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Now, this is Jesus' famous sermon, right? His famous Sermon on the Mount. But we're in the second chapter, right? See, we see, we see Jesus' turning kind of left in his talk. He started in chapter 5, and he was saying, this is how you enter the kingdom, this is how the kingdom advances, this is how we're called to live. And then he says, but when you do good deeds, when you do practice righteousness, so Jesus is making this assumption that those in the audience, they want to do good things, right? They want to practice righteousness. And that's, that's on us too, right? We don't, we don't want to just exist like we talked about in our previous study, we want to live life that matters. Jesus is talking to people who want to live a life that matters. Jesus is talking to people who want to do good things. Jesus says that 
don't think this is just a, a shift in behavior. I mean, sure, you can have a behavior reset, but, he says, your heart needs to be in the right place also. In fact, what he says is, if your heart isn't in the right place, I don't even want it. If your heart isn't in the right place, you're not going to be rewarded. A little further down, he says, thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. And then jump all the way down to verse 16. He says, and when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that they are fasting, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. Fasting, back in Jesus' day, was a practice of going without. You would give something up in order to focus more on God, more on faith. And typically, they gave up food. But people who fasted were very public about it. They would wear itchy sackcloth clothing. They would sprinkle ashes on their head. In fact, their entire appearance and demeanor would be the same as if they were mourning somebody who died. Jesus also says, and when you give to the poor, don't be a hypocrite. Jesus uses the word hypocrite a lot, especially when he talks about religious people. Now, we know how we use the word hypocrite today, but in the Greek, back in Jesus' day, the word had the same meaning as an actor, an actor who would be on stage. You know, one of the things we've learned recently from archaeology is about four miles from Nazareth, where Jesus grew up, was the city of Sepphoris. It was a huge, booming metropolis. Josephus described it as the ornament of Galilee. Well, in those ruins, they've discovered a beautiful ancient Greek theater, which means about an hour's walk from where Jesus' childhood home was, there was a place where Greek plays were shown. So Jesus knew exactly what an actor was. And this is the word he uses to describe religious people. He says, so when you give to the needy, when you fast, when you do your religious acts, we need to ask ourselves, why am I doing this? Is it just to be seen? Is my heart in the right place? And who is really on stage here? Is it us or is it God? And this lesson makes it into Jesus' most famous sermon, right? The Sermon on the Mount. Because Jesus knew that for us, for you and for me, our biggest temptation, our biggest issue, the one place that would be the most difficult in us, maybe going off the road, wasn't heresy. It wasn't preaching the wrong thing. No, Jesus warns, don't do it for the wrong reasons. Christians are, are, have the greatest temptation to go through the motions and be an actor, to just fake it to be phony. Jesus says, beware of doing good to be seen, to be performing, which is not how it's modeled in the world. Common wisdom says, if you give a ton of money to Africa, go on Oprah and tell the world, right? We celebrate the philanthropists and we'll even go so far as, far as to shame the rich if we discover that they don't give their money away. But Jesus doesn't say, when you give, tell everyone. In fact, he says the opposite. In fact, Jesus is never more angry with anyone than the religious leaders. Why? Because they drew the attention and the praise away from God and onto themselves. Friends, the most dangerous place to stand is center stage. In fact, there is a story in the Bible about this very thing. Acts 12 says, Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord, and having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's county for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, The voice of a god and not of a man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. The historian Josephus 
says that King Agrippa's royal robes also consisted of a golden suit of armor. And his posture, the shiny gold armor, his voice, it all won the people over in this talk. And the people in the audience mistook him for a god. And because Agrippa didn't deflect that praise, he didn't deny it, God killed him on the spot. The most dangerous place is the stage. When we absorb all the credit that belongs to God. Friends, it's not about us. Jesus asks in the Sermon on the Mount, where is our heart? As a human being, it's our nature to want to be liked, to want to be accepted. I'll even go so far as to say we want people to be impressed. We want people to be impressed with us. And we can do our selfless acts. We can do our giving and our piety. But we need to do it with ourselves not on the stage and making sure that all the glory and all the praise goes to God. In Exodus chapter 3, it says, Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God says to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Listen, this is one of the most powerful verses in all of scripture because it reveals to us the name of our God. And if God's name means I am, then what do you think that makes our name? It means I am not. If God is I am, then I am not. And that can be scary. While we build this world, the world outside encourages me to build my own kingdom. But Jesus encourages me to build his. This weekend, I uh, got to get away and see the ocean. I could sit on the beach, stare at the ocean all day long. It's peaceful. The ocean makes me feel good. Do you know why? Because it reminds me that I'm small. Well, so do mirrors, but that's a different story. But you know what I mean. I stand next to the ocean's edge and I don't feel like a big shot anymore. I stand next to a mountain and I weep. The world wants me to take control, take charge, step up, and all of that can feel so overwhelming. And I think to myself, I need a reset. I need more reminders of how small I am. I don't need more reminders about how much in charge I am. The world overwhelms me. The world makes me tired. I, I know the masks are coming off. I know fully vaccinated people are enjoying their newfound liberties, and we're all talking about how it'll never be the same again. We're talking about living in a new normal. 2 Corinthians 5 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old passed away, and behold, the new has come. Psalm 51 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Church, I think as Christians, we should be looking for a renewed normal. So how do I know? I mean, maybe I'm serving and giving and I'm doing it for the wrong reasons. How do I know if my heart is in the right place? Well, one, I would say, well, do you get jealous easy? Do I get jealous if some people uh, don't pat me on the back and they pat somebody else on the back? Am I jealous that some people are in the clique and I'm not? Do I grumble? Do I complain if I, what I do goes unnoticed? Do I tell others how I don't get thanked? I did that, I can't believe anybody didn't say anything. Do I feel entitled that my status or tenure or rank or years of service somehow makes me better than other people? Or that I deserve better? Or that I deserve to be the first? Let's go back up to verse three and find Jesus' instructions for us. Matthew 6 says, But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And go back down to verse 17. 
It says, but when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. Jesus says, do good and don't tell anybody. How do you know if you're living in a renewed normal? How can you tell if the reset worked? Well, ask yourself, who are you living for? Are you living for yourself? Or are you living for God? Are you building your kingdom or his? Are you concerned with his image or yours? Jesus says that your giving may be in secret. So what are you doing in secret? I don't know. Maybe you don't want to tell us. John Calvin said the theater of God is in the hidden places. What do we do in solitude? What do we do in that time? What do we do in secret? And maybe the answer will tell us who we really are. And if you don't like the answer to that question, join the club. None of us usually do. Jesus says, do good and tell no one. That's the opposite of how we live. Typically, we hide all of our bad deeds and we put our good deeds on YouTube. Paul writes to the church in Ephesus to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Jesus wants us to reset our life. Jesus wants us to live a renewed normal. Now, a person who's paying attention might ask, Pastor David, how can we be an example if we do everything in secret? First Timothy 4, Paul says, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers as examples in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Paul tells Timothy to be an example. Jesus says in Matthew 5, let your good deeds shine before others. All true. And there's no conflict. Because remember, it's about our motivation, our hearts, and who we put on stage. Who is it all for? Even here at Walden Church, I don't want to ever put on a show for you. We're not trying to entertain you. What we do here, when we worship, when we give, has to be done with the right heart for the right reason. But there is a lot going on when you put on a play. And everyone wants to be the actor on the stage. I was in drama in high school, but I never auditioned for a play. I mean, sure, I did some small one acts and I did a few monologues, but nothing that ever involved rehearsals or costumes or sets. But there were other kids who did the costuming or moved the sets around. There was kids who did the sound system and they did the lighting. And you know, even though it takes all of those people to put on a play, only the actors get flowers when the play is over. Christians, we have to be the lighting crew, the techs, the assistants. Is it easy to take a back seat? No, especially if, like me, right now, you find yourself standing here. Believe me, the irony is not lost on me. I am literally standing on a stage. And when you serve out in front, people will watch and they will criticize and they will judge. Listen, I can't always lead a church well. I can't always preach well. I'm not always a good boss. I'm not always a good dad. I'm not always a good husband. Trust me, I feel like an imposter and a failure all of the time. I'm terrible at receiving criticism. And I'm even worse at receiving praise. So I need to learn to lean on God. More. Make him center stage. More. The best thing we can do is make sure we know 
our hearts are in the right place, and it's not about us, and that it's about God. And when ego and jealousy and grumbling and entitlement rear their ugly heads, I need to remember who should be center stage. I can't ever forget who really sits on the throne. Because I don't want any of this to be about me. I'm a drop of water in the ocean. I'm a speck of dirt that sits on a mountain. Friends, let's push the reset button this summer. My challenge for us this summer is to make Christ the center stage of our lives. I want us to be so in love with Christ this summer. I want us to go out and be ministers in our community and we can start by asking, how can I serve? Or what are my spiritual gifts? That's a good place to start. We just did a members class a week ago. The next one coming up is on spiritual gifts. Have you taken our spiritual gifts class? I would invite you to join it. Meet some people and learn about yourself and how God has uniquely made you so that when you serve, it's an act of love and appreciation to God. And together, we will learn how to build up God's church not taking center stage, just lighting the way. Let's pray together. Lord God, as summer begins, we pray that you give each one the relaxation, the rest, and the reset that they need. Lord, be with those who travel on vacation. Be with those who continue to work. Be with our first responders as they continue to make our lives safe. Be with our children. Give them the rest and the enjoyment that they need this summer. Be with our teachers. Give them the refreshing that they need to continue their great work. Lord, we pray for each one here in church that we would continue to learn our spiritual gifts and that we would learn how to serve more, to be the church more, to love more in this community, to be known as a light on a hill that shines the way to God's kingdom. And we ask all of this in your son Jesus' precious name. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching this morning. Thanks for joining us. Maybe you're listening to this as an MP3, or maybe you're watching this on YouTube. Either way, there is a address up at the top, a URL. You can always clip and copy that and post it to your own Facebook or social media wall. Let other people know how you spent your Sunday morning, or you can post it to a friend's wall if you think they might benefit from it. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to this channel, and I'll see you guys next week. Thanks. Bye.